All right, so we're ready to get started. Our speaker today is Tom Amrine. Tom is actually a graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He got an ag, I'm sorry, a degree in the College of Agriculture in the Department of Agribusiness. I believe the major was called Farm Management at the time. Is that right, Tom? And you graduated in 1980, is that what it was? Yep. yep. 1980. So he got his bachelor's degree and and there's a lot in between there and now, but I'm gonna let him tell you about that. He's currently vice president at Naturite Berry Growers and general manager for Elkhorn Berry Farms. He's been, he spent many years in agriculture and many years uh, farming strawberries. So he's gonna talk to us today about growing strawberries in California. Tom? All right. Uh, wanna share your screen? Okay. So, well, before I do that, just a couple comments, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, I went went to Cal Poly, got out of Cal Poly, and then went back up to the Watsonal area where I was raised in and started growing strawberries. So I've been doing that for over 40 years. Um, most of the vast majority of that time was um, my own farming operation that eventually uh, was, we were marketing through a co-op and, and then that co-op like many co-ops in California became a corporation and then the farming operation merged into that corporation and the farming operation still continues, but it's owned by that corporation of which I'm now the vice president and, and, and continue to be general manager of the, of the farming company, which is kind of the way it's gone in California agriculture. I got a, came out of Cal Poly there with a degree in what they called farm management, which was kind of a, it was an option in the ag management department and it was, for people who are going to go back to family farms or have their, you know, start a farm on their own, which I did. I think I um, started this farming operation and it, it was kind of, um, it, there was two, there was ag, ag business management and, ag man, and farm management. So like the farm management guys, I to tell Gerald, it was kind of like, it, probably we weren't like, they didn't figure we were the brightest ones of the bunch because like, we didn't even get double entry accounting. We, they didn't, we didn't even get that, you know, it was just like, balance your checkbook, you know, it's pretty basic stuff. It was, it was very interesting how they did it. And then that was reformed and brought up to speed. So we didn't have computers. There was uh, only one computer um, be between Cal Poly San Luis and Cal Poly Pomona, there was one computer and the computer was at Pomona. And we used to have to do the punch cards, you know, the, you probably know what it is. We had typed these things that pokes holes in the card. We'd have these big decks of cards and we'd be there all night typing them out. And then you take a courier would come and take them to Pomona to run them through the computer over there. And there was one little glitch in one card, you know, then the next day the courier would come back and you'd have your deck and they'd say, well, there's a bad card in the deck, you know, and then you have to go back and try to find it. So you, we were lucky to run like in a class, you do like one regression analysis the whole year because that's how long, you know, they would have like 12, you know, be a small sample of like 12 and you would do this regression analysis over the computer and it would take you the whole deal, the whole some or a quarter to do it. So anyway, times have changed. Um, and then the, and in this PowerPoint, we're going to go through, um, I mean, obviously I'm not a, I'm a farmer, not a teacher or a PowerPoint designer, but the way that PowerPoint is, I kind of set it up. There's some tables, you're going to see there's some slides that are like, piled with charts and data that you can't really probably even see it hardly, but I also made it like a reference document, right? So that it's there and then you guys can download, I, you know, Gerald, I guess you guys can download it. And then- uh, and, and I've already posted it there. So yeah, it's yeah. available for download right now. And then more about the, my background and, you know, life as, far, as a farmer and kind of the way the career went, there's a, there was actually a podcast about that. That was pretty good. I think you've posted, and I'm not gonna, you know, you didn't come here to talk about me. You came here to talk about berries. So if you want to know more about Kind of history and life, you know, what it was, you know, farming and, and how it goes. Um, there is that. And oh, the last thing I was going to say was so if you're in this class, I can't remember if I told Gerald this, but I, with all this COVID and everything, it's like we're kind of over it up here. So if you're in the class and you want to come see a strawberry farm, and then then Gerald, you know, Gerald, you can give them my, you know, con contact information. The farm's open, you know, or if a few of you want to come up on your own, I guess you can't do con conjunction with the school, but you know, if y'all want, if one of you or three or four of you want to come up and see the farm here in Watsonville and, and spend the day up here, that's, that'd be great. And we will do that. And it doesn't have to be, you know, necessarily 
you could do that on your own. I can invite so it's you. It's not a school sponsored event, <laughs> but school uh, sponsored. you're welcome <laughs> to do things like yeah. that. And that's quite an offer, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You just tell me when to forward or yep. say next and I'll go. Right. Uh, so there we go. Growing strawberries in California, general overview. So this is going to take about 50, 50 minutes to get through this, um, which is, I know you used to think when I was in school, man, four o'clock class, that's really hard to stay awake. I don't know if it's still that way. That was like the worst time of the day. So hopefully you can all <laughs> stay awake. Uh, and then uh, and then a general, I guess you can manage if somebody has a question, right? Like they raise their hand or something or whatever you want. Yeah, to do I'll there. be watching the chat. And OK, uh, OK. So all right. Please. Let's, yep. Let's dive into it then. All right. Next slide is going to be. All right, here we go. OK, so this is an overview of the industry, which Gerald kind of talked about already, where we've got on the right side, you've got the, the the counties in California where where uh, where the strawberry major strawberry production is, of course, there's roadside type operations all up and down the state. But for the big commercial production, it's in the coastal counties. Um, strawberries is actually the um, fourth biggest crop in California by dollar value, which is pretty hard to believe. So, uh, but it's only thirty five thousand acres, right? So, almonds. Ammons uh, uh, are on uh, 1.2 million acres, and they're the, they're uh, they're above just above strawberries in terms of the value of crops, but they're on 1.2 million acres. Strawberries are on 35,000 acres, right? So it's it's a very small acreage, and it runs about the gross sales is up over sixty thousand dollars an acre. Um, so it kind of gives you a scale of 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 the value of the crop. And, and where it's grown. And of course, about half of that billions of dollars, you know, ends up in payroll, right? Goes back to payroll, goes back to hand harvest and everything. So it's a big, big employer, biggest ag employer in the, in the, in the industry in the state. Okay, next one. Going on to the next one we've got. So when we look at that big industry, you know, what are the, and it has been a successful industry, what are the keys to success? And that kind of actually, um, ranked it here that, you know, in, in typical of farming. So that's the other thing I was going to say. What I'm saying here, I'm trying to set this up. So it kind of applies to all different crops, right? Is to get you thinking about what it means to farm. But it really does come down to hard work, perseverance, and luck. You kind of got to have that. Then you get into the correct varieties, the, you know, the correct microclimates, the correct soil and water. Once you got all that, you know, then you apply your management skills. But you know, at the at, you know, management skills aren't going to save you if you don't have hard work and perseverance, and then a little good luck along the way. Um, all right, keep going. Is, there. is when you say management skills, is that really like a human resources? Are you talking well, about yeah, managing just, people? How, yeah. How do you put the all? Yeah. How do you? How do you? Uh, you know, given the correct variety, the microclimate, the soil, and the water, then then what do you do with that? How do you manage it? And the, on all the resources that go into it, which people skills and strawberries, you know, people's one of the biggest, right? Because it, it's not mechanized; it's all hand harvest. Okay, but it's so not it, it's not just people; it's all of it. All of it, yeah, all yeah, and you have to do all of it. You know, you can't. You, and you know, if you're, you, and I always say like, you know, in farming, you've got to be. You, you know, you've got to, to be successful. You got to be at, at, you know above average in everything, and you really got to be good at something. <laughs> All right, and in that whole big set, yeah, you can't. You ain't gonna make it being average across the board. You won't make it. Okay, go ahead. We'll go down to start talking about the next one, which is. Uh, well, I wanted to start with because this is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. It's about the, the, the importance of varieties, and so. Um, Going to the next slide, we're going to see a, a fairly complex chart right here. But genetics and the varietal selection is is uh, and having correct varieties is absolutely fundamental to the success of, of the industry. And what I did here was I went through, and again, this is really fine print. We're not going to go through that that much, but you can go back and look at it. But what I'm showing here is that from when you first cross pollinate a flower with the pollen from another plant that first that first cross until the time you have a variety a commercial variety that's about 12 years it takes about 12 years but you've got to repeat that 
that uh, the first four or five steps, those first four or five years, you've got to replicate those five or eight times before you ever have a chance at a, at a successful variety, right? Nobody ever gets lucky the first cross, right? It takes about five years of crossing before you get a cross that will ever make it down to the 12th year. And so what, it, so what that tells you is that your cycle between varieties, as new varieties cycle in and out of the industry, it's about an eight, eight to 10 year cycle. And there's many, many steps in that. And as you can see in line three there, there's a number of 15,000. So typically a, a breeding program might be looking at 15,000 crosses a year. And then they have to do that for five to eight years before they get two or three that are good enough to move on down to that 12th year. So you can imagine, you know, you're looking at, you're weeding out, you know, like 50 to 100,000 crosses to get something that might be a commercial variety. So let's go next to the next one. And what we'll do is we'll kind of look at this, this shows here in my, in my time farming. So I started in, in 80 up, um, up till now, that's every, the main varieties that I've used, I've had in the field. That's how they cycle. Ico, Selva, Diamante, Albion, Monterey. So I'm growing Monterey right now as my main variety. Royce is just coming online. So in 40 a, years. Tom, we've got a hand raised. Uh, Brooke, okay. you wanna ask your question? Yeah, um, so I I live actually on six acres of strawberries. I've moved these out. And so are you saying that you guys incorporate um, different varieties in that same block or um, are you just saying that you use that same variety? Okay, it was pretty amazing what you're saying, but so an eight to 10 year cycle, you have to use the same variety and is it like bare root that you guys just use? Yep. Yeah. So what happens is in any given district or climate area, there's always going to be one or two main varieties, the most productive, right? And that's what you're going to grow. And those varieties will cycle out, but it takes them, um, like in this case here, you can see in, in the last 40 years, I've cycled through those varieties. Uh, it's all, you know, it's a, it took them about, about an average of nine years per, so the, a, a new variety will last in the industry for like nine years and they're eight or nine years and then something else will come along that's better and finally kick it out. But it takes that long to cycle through the varieties. So you'll, oh. you'll, you'll grow a mixture of varieties, correct? And one yeah. will sort of be waning and the other one will be increasing. Right, so right now I'm, I, my acreage right now is 100% Monterey up here in the Northern, I'm 100% Monterey. Next year, I'll be 90% Monterey, 10% Royce. It's a brand new one that looks like it's gonna replace Monterey, but to get, to completely weed out Monterey, if, if any of those, like Royce is really the one, you know, that'll take three or four years before I, before I have confident, confident enough to like not ever plant Monterey and just keep going with the new one, okay? All right, so let's look at the next uh, next uh, slide here, which is going to be, um, I'm gonna go quickly through the breeding process. So this is how it starts. Here's a, they, they collect the pollen off of a, of a one flower and they paint it onto the other flower to, to pollinate it. And then they, they, uh, they tag those in the, and then those develop into fruit, which you can just pretty much go through this, uh, Gerald, next one was gonna show, I think, uh, those fruits produce, and of course the strawberry has seeds on the outside of the, of the berry, right? It's all those little rough spots or seeds. Every seed's different on the strawberry. They're, they, they're different within a range, but they're all different. And so they, you literally take the berries, you take them and blend them up, you strain the seeds out and dry them out, and then you start, then you plant, you germinate those seeds, which the next slide's gonna show um should show that you've got uh this is what a, a germination uh place looks like where we're germinating into where the breeders are generating individual seeds and that's they grow up from a seed there's the plant and they're all tagged and they're like families so they are like families they're like the each seed is like brothers and sisters they're all kind of similar but not not none of them are exactly the same all right 
keep going there, Gerald, to the next one. And now we see that the seedlings have grown up and then the seedlings are taken out into open fields and they're planted out and then that's where they're observed. And you grow them out and the breeders will grow them out and then they'll start to collect data on them, you know, size, flavor, shape, productivity. Um, and then they start weeding them out real quick because at this level there's 15,000 and they want to get it down to just out of those there may only be maybe one or two that they'll actually keep for the next round uh for the next season to continue to monitor them so go to the next one there uh Gerald and so here uh and one of the things that has to be done with strawberries which, which is I think true 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 also in the in the you'd find it in the orchard industry but but you have to have a, a all strawberries carry virus and you have to have a very clean stock and because you can't be passing passing virus through the system because strawberries are 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 produced at once you've got a variety it's not you don't replicate it with seed you replicate it with the runners and then we'll see how you do that you're actually it's cloned all the strawberry plants are all cloned from one mother plant that mother plant has to be perfectly clean and so this is, this is what a, a Meristem lab looks like. And they go down to that plant that they think is the, the one that's gonna be the variety. And they just take a few cells right off the tip of the growing point down in the crown of the plant. And then they uh, put those in test tubes, grow them out. And then now you've got your first batch of clones, exact clean replicas. And they do it at a high temperature, uh, almost enough to kill the plant because they have to get the temperature up in the greenhouse. It's up around a hundred and I want to say it's 130, somewhere around there, degrees, because what they want to do is kill the virus in the plants, but not kill the plants. And it goes through this cycle like that of clean, cleaning the plant. And that gives you a clean plant to start uh, with when you finally select that. And it's that one plant. And maybe it was it, at one point, it is just one plant uh, that might, and then it, this would be the mother plant. All right, you can keep going there, Gerald. Um, and then the mother plants are planted out. And now you can see propagation starting. So now you see the, the mother plant's been meristemmed. It's been grown out. It's been put into these sterile environment greenhouses where everything's sterilized and, and all that. And they make runners. And that's what those little shoots are coming out. And each shoot, it, as you can see the shoots, every so far, there's a node on those shoots. And they start to make other plants. Well, those are all trimmed off. They're perfect clones of the mother plant they're perfectly clean there's been no virus vectors or anything and then those become the first step in propagation of of making enough plants so that the growers can can plant and that's how they uh they keep it clean through the system all right let's go to the next and now you can see the top left hand slide here you can see this is a nursery up in northern california up in the butte valley uh by the clam just up on the uh, clam edge of the klamath basin uh, Mount Shasta there in the background. And so these are these individual mother plants early on and they're planted out and they make runners in the soil. And then those, and that sterile soil has been fumigated and then those are dug up and taken into other fields the next year because they have more plants and more plants. And then finally you get to the point where you have millions of mother plants planted in these large fields producing you know hundreds of millions of runners and then each runner will have three or four nodes on it. And those nodes become the plants that we plant down here in the nurse, down here in the fruiting fields. And- um, so Got a we'll question, come Tom. Sure. Go ahead, Go Jose. Ahead. What do nurseries do with the fruit that the plants produce? So they don't, okay, it's a good question. They do not allow the plants to produce fruit because that's a couple of things. It's a, it, it creates a lack of, so you prune the flowers off. They will flower up in the nurseries. So you want to cut the flowers off because you want this, what you're after is what they call, uh, you're trying to maintain um, 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 what they call asexual production. So you want the plant to simply be making vegetation, to be making runners. You don't want sexual propagation. You don't want to waste energy on seed. The seeds are worthless. All you want is those runners. So you cut the, you keep cutting the flowers off. Also, the flowers are an entryway for um, a fungal disease like um, um, <laughs> Daryl, help me out. Like like um, botrytis. No, the other one, um, anthracnose. Anthracnose, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, anthracnose can enter the plant through the flower, so up in the nursery. So it's very important to keep the flowers and the fruit picked off and they carry them out. They carry it out literally, uh, dump it and bury it. Okay. It's a very, it's a very labor intensive thing to do. And they have yes. to go through the field about once a month to remove yep. the blooms. Right. And so what they're doing is they, and they're trying to maintain what they call asexual production. And then when we turn it into the nurt, when we get down here, we force the plant to go to sexual production. We want it to flower. We want it to make fruit because that's what we're going to eat. Okay, next one. And I think the next slide we'll be getting into um, uh, looking at, uh, here we go, harvest. So the, the plants have grown up and they're harvested at night because uh, a number of reasons. One is you want it cool. Um, you don't want to harvest when it's warm. Of course, a lot of times these, by the time they do harvest up in Northern California in October, November, of course, it's already freezing temperatures, but they can get some really dry, windy days. So they, they, they will harvest at night. And then at the same time, by harvesting at night, they can get these runners, which are now just this big mass of tangled runners with these little nodes on them with the roots starting to come out. That all has to be, it has to be peeled up like sod. They peel it, if you can see that machine, the tractor there with the light on up on the left, it's, it's very similar to lifting up sod in a sod farm. Well, that has to be done and then it's taken immediately into a trim shed. And, um, oh, before I do that, so they're digging it up like sod. On the, on the right-hand side there on the top, there's a, a bunch of uh, straw uh, plants. Those are the actual runner nodes in the field. They're still attached to the runner, but each node has made roots, right? So, and you can see there's a pen there. That's just a, my pencil in the picture showing that every node on that runner has produced roots. And it's like all connected like a rope. Well, that's gotta go now in, into the trim shed. So the next slide's gonna show um, a trim shed and we're literally hundreds of people at a time. And there's thousands that, in this trim sheds, there's thousands of people they're having to take that kind of those strings of runners and they, they cut them off. So that all you're left with is a node with the runner, with the uh, roots on it. And that's what we plant down here. And it takes thousands of people to do that because we have to do all this within about six weeks at the, in, in October, November, where uh, uh, there's very short period of time to harvest the crop and get it down here and get it in the ground. Uh, because what we're doing is manipulating the, uh, what you call it, the um, <laughs> dormancy cycle. So it all has to be done within a very short period of time with the right day length conditions and everything has to be just right to trigger the sexual propagation in the plant. Okay, next slide. So here is the finished, a trimmed runner with the, the, the runners have been trimmed off the plant nodes and you get these rooty root, you know, the roots around the crown and then those uh, go into a, a plastic lined box um, and those are the plants that are then shipped down here within a few days and we put them in the ground down here in our area okay in California in southern you know southern areas of California for fruit production and so that kind of tells the story of how varieties are created very briefly anyway it was it's we're going quick through it but you know how a variety is created but then also how it's propagated and if you in that first slide if we, we're not going to go back there but from that one mother plant, you're looking at um, um, a, if it if a success a successful variety will probably be used in about 10% of the industry, and about 10% of the industry would be like uh, 55, 60 million plants a year. So that one mother plant in that clean room being propagated out by meristem and in a test tube, that one mother plant then is able to produce 55 million plants a year for the lifetime of that variety in the industry. So it's quite a, quite a process. Okay, next, next one is uh, this last, this will be the last one on, on nursery. So this is a, a picture, aerial picture I took from, uh, it's up in the Butte Valley and it's a really cool picture because in the center of the picture from left to right, you could see there's uh, four roughly equal rectangular blocks of land. So the far left one is kind of tan colored. That's got like a ryegrass cover crop on it. Then the next one 
it's got kind of a white color. That's fumigation plastic. And if you look real close, the upper edge of that fumigation plastic, there's a dark area across the field and then a little gray area, then there's another dark line and then the rest of the field is gray. What's happening there is that field's being fumigated as a picture was taken. So the tractors are chiseling the land in front of the fumigation machine. And then the fumigation machine's coming and covering it with plastic and pumping the fumigant in under the plastic. We have, I'll show some pictures of a close up. But so that's land being prepared for the following season's nursery crop. Right in the middle is the current season crop being grown. It's almost ready for harvest. This was probably taken, uh, I think this picture was taken maybe in September, August, September, their last cut of alfalfa, that's alfalfa below it. And then, um, so it's getting close to harvest. And then the right side is again, a ryegrass cover crop two seasons out. So that's a typical nursery operation up in Northern California for strawberries. And it's, it's kind of cool to see it like that. That was, a, that was a pretty good explanation of that. Okay, so that's the, that's the propagation side, the growing side of strawberry plants. Uh, not the fruit side. Now we'll go to. Now we're going to start talking about fruit. Um, and so what we're going to talk about now is we're going to move down into the coast of California, talking about microclimates, water, and soil for the fruiting uh, uh, production of strawberries. Okay, so let's go with that. Um, so start with that map again. It makes it look like there's a lot of land in California where you can plant strawberries, but on the right side. But if you really circle the general microclimate areas where you can grow strawberries commercially in California, it's those three little yellow dots on the map. Okay, so it, it's not a big area. Now the next slide, we're gonna to go to the next slide and we're gonna look just at that top dot. So the top dot was in uh, Watsonville Salinas production area. So if you took that little yellow circle and now what of that area actually can you grow strawberries? Within that one little microclimate zone, how much of it is really available for strawberries? Well, you, you know, and you can see here, what I did was I, I mapped out the urban areas in that climate zone, and then also the what wildlands. So there's a whole strip right through the middle of that there that that's um, you know park, uh, state park, and nature preserve, and all that. And then you see there's a an orange area. There's an orange line there. Um, uh, it says Pajaro Dunes. That area right there, as it's pointed out, that's like a the premium climate zone in the whole world probably for strawberries. And you can see the scale of it's only from end to end of that area is only 24 miles. So there's, while there's strawberries throughout the area there outside of the urban and, and, and wildlands, the, the best climates up there in that little orange area. Okay, that's the micro, that's the microclimate for strawberries in the Northern district, we'll say. So let's look at that a little bit. So in the next slide, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna see that very little a part of that northern little perfect climate area. So, and this is an old soil map from back in the 1930s. They're kind of cool because they're in color. Um, and you can see on the bottom right, that's the ocean. There's some stripes, gray area that stripes and in the beach, you can see the sand on the beach, that soil. So this is a soil map of the best strawberry land in the world. With, and this is a five by five mile square, looking at that area. Well, there's 12 soil types in that five by five square, five by five mile square, and probably three of them are good for strawberries. So you got this fantastic climate, but there's very, very few soil areas in there that are good for berries. And then, and the best soil area, and the best climate combination is right there where that bright yellow line kind of loops around where my uh, orange arrow points in the middle of it. The, uh, the University of California breeding uh, a program was in that area for for uh, how many years they were there? They started in the in the fifth nineteen fifties until just a few years ago. They're up there fifty, you know, seventy five years there. They had a, a breeding uh, facility there. Um, best strawberry land in the world. But now we got a problem, and that yellow area, that yellow bright yellow line I, I mapped there, this area has become infested with a a type of fusarium that is absolutely fatal to strawberry plants. And we don't have methyl bromide, we don't have the fumigation tools anymore to kill it. And so this area has been the best 
soil and climate combination in the world is being you know, severely damaged for strawberry production because the fusarium disease is in there and we can't get rid of it. And so it's, it's ruining it. So it's, I'm just trying to get you to think about, you know, when you go out and you start the farm and you see something, there's a reason for everything. You know, like somebody might drive down that road someday and say, gee, you know, this is the perfect place for strawberries. Why, you know, why isn't this guy growing strawberries? I'm going to rent that land and plant strawberries. <laughs> you got to be careful because it land probably doesn't have strawberries on it because it's full of fusarium. And you've got to check that kind of stuff out. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, and this is a picture of a ranch right in that area. Um, it was generally used to be considered, this is probably one of the finest strawberry uh, ranches in the world. Um, and if you look at those yellow circles, what I, what I circled there, this, this, was, this picture was taken in September last year. In June last year, that whole section in there was bright green, producing strawberries like you couldn't believe. By September, it was almost completely dead. And you can see these brown tilled areas. Those, those were productive strawberries in June. They died and they'd already been removed and dissed up by September because they had died. And then the rest of that, with whatever little bit left in there is green, is just the tail end of it. And, uh, very sad, and it was even more sad because it was actually my ranch. So it was, it was a pretty miserable year. But, but that shows you what, what soil disease can do to strawberries. It's, so Tom, it's how, long, how long do you typically go in a season? You say this, those patches that are dead, they had how much yeah. life would they normally have left in them? How many more weeks or months? Well, that's some, a lot of that stuff was dead and we were disking stuff up in June. So they had just gotten through halfway. So we lost, we probably lost 10% of the first half of the crop. We lost 50% to 75% of the last half of the crop because we could have harvested through November. Wow. So it was devastating. Uh, it's just, Jack, just, just, Jack's got a question. Yeah. Yeah, it's just on the topic of soil disease, what are some um, soil borne diseases you've recently encountered? Uh, is it verticillium? Is it macrofomina, et cetera? Right. So, okay, it's all of those things depending where you're at. And that's, that's to my point, right? So if you're intimately knowledgeable, let's say the industry up there in that area, you would know where is the fusarium, you would know where is, uh, which, which farms have the verticillium and which farms have macrofamina and then some farms have all of it. But yeah, I mean, like, so for me, I, I know, I mean, I, I know, I know on individual farms that I've never even farmed, I know where the macrofamina is, everybody does, because we, we you know, we, that's, we, we have to know that because we don't want to be renting that ranch and farming it ourselves and then being, you know, left with that problem. So uh, fusarium in this, in this particular area is really bad. There's other areas uh, where it's macrofamina and then to a lesser extent, um, verticillium is also a problem. Um, and you can see here in this picture, I said that uh, this, this loss on this ranch uh, was $40,000 an acre. We lost $40,000 an acre in gross sales potential. And then because we didn't harvest it, that was a $20,000 per acre loss payroll. You know, payroll that was lost. So it's just not about the farm, but the people that work there and everything in the industry. You know, that's $20,000 an acre in potential payroll that was lost yeah and then right. you, have spend, you have to spend money on fumigation efforts to get rid of these diseases and everything so right the, the problem we have right now is is of course our challenge is that we well it's not really my challenge at my age it's your challenge <laughs> it's your challenge you know we don't have the fumigants to you know we can't kill the verticillium can't kill the macrofamina we don't have the materials to do that. And that's the challenge. So, and how we're going to fix that is probably two pronged, right? If the genetics, and that's kind of why I spent some time on the breeding, it's probably going to be resistance in the genetic side. And it's going to be maybe depending on the regulatory world, something on the, on the chemical side as well. Okay. All right, Gerald, let's keep going. I know I, I you watch my time, Gerald, because it looks like I'm not, I don't have a lot of time here. I'm, burn, I'm not going as fast as I thought I would be. Here's just another quick example, another aerial picture. And this shows a, a strawberry field last year in a different part of the valley. And you can see the die out inside that yellow area. This field is dying out and it, a lot of it died out. And I just showed this because 
it disrupts the whole industry because he has this beautiful ranch that was highly productive. And there's a big strawberry cooler right across the street, right? This is like the primo setup. It's built for efficiency. It's built, you know, it's what the industry built. And now this disruption with soil disease, you know, they're going to lose that ranch for strawberries. And then now that cooler is isolated, not as close as it was to where it was built, you know, where it was in the center of, of, a, of, a, of an area that had a lot of strawberries. So it's very disruptive um, to the whole thing. Okay, Gerald, next one. Um, now we're going to talk about Another thing that comes up in our industry is, so strawberries grow best around the coastlands and coastlands, especially in California, have a lot of sand hills and those sand hills typically operate, they're baked mostly in the best climate zones. Uh, and so we have a lot, especially in the Northern district, there's a lot of problems with soil erosion. Uh, it's a big environmental problem for us. And here you can see a picture of some rolling hills that were that are in strawberries or, or or cycled out of them, and you can see there was a rain, and you can see these this like a blowout there on that field, the lower circle where there's this alluvium, this sand that's blown out in a wash, and it's gone down to the creek. There's a, a ditch that goes through there, and then there's a holding pond that's all muddied up, and so this is a big problem for us. It's a big management challenge. Um, go to the next slide there, um, Gerald, and I think we'll get a. Here's another view. Again, where I, you see this blown out erosion, and then you see in the blue down there is, this, is a, is a, is a, is a uh, waterway where this sand gets in there and plugs it up. But you can see that there's different management even in this area. So up on the left corner there, you know, they had a cover crop, the cover crop got established before the rains came, so that protects. But here there was a different cropping pattern. Uh, maybe they were gonna, I don't know, do a Brussels, maybe they thought they were going to do something with it. Anyway, no cover crop. And this is what happens. It's very difficult, extremely expensive to manage this. So let's go to the next slide on, on erosion. We'll look at our, our soil management here. Um, you can flop it over there, Gerald, if we go. Okay. Um, okay. We'll get into, okay. So that kind of covered the erosion thing. Just, just something to think about. Again, things that people don't often think about. Now we'll get into how we grow strawberries a little bit. Um, this chart's another one you guys can go back and look at. It's showing that your planting cycle, because so strawberries is an annual crop, but the planting cycle, it starts about 20, months, about 20 months before harvest. So your planting cycle is way far longer than annual. And that's because you, you've got to, you got to do two things. You got to identify land to be planted because there's because it, while it's an annual crop, it's in the ground for 16 or 17 months. So it 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 you have to have rotation land, right? It's not a 12 month crop. It's planted annually, but it lasts for 17 months. So you've always got to have an equal amount of ground somewhere to what you're growing this year, because you're not going to be able to take it out in time to replant the following year. So for every acre of field planted, you have to have another acre waiting. So you've got to have that, you know, 20 months out, you better know where your land is. You better have your leases set up. You better understand that. About 13 months out, you got to put your, um, um, your plant orders in because we went to the whole thing on how they propagate plants. Those all have to be grown. They have to have their orders. They have to get paid, those nursery guys, to, to grow those plants. So that's, that's 13 months before harvest. And then ground prep. Look at fumigation, nine, eight, nine months before you harvest, you're, you're doing your fumigation and everything that comes after that. And then harvest starts April, May. And then, then you've got the next nine months to, to finish it up. So that's harvest, harvest peaks in June, November, you're all done, but you've got to clean up the field. You've got to remove the irrigation system because there's going to be a rotation crop come in that's not strawberries. Um, and then by December, if you don't have a rotation crop, then you're going to be planting a cover crop. So that, that, that kind of shows how, how, how the industry cycles through a crop, especially in the Northern District. Okay, um, let's go to the next one, ground prep. So let's look, how do we prep ground? And I just put this in again, a chart you can look at later, but it, it shows how many, how intense is the tillage, right? So 15, uh, 15 uh, tillage passes even on sandy soil to get to, to, to where you're ready to plant the crop. And, you know, and what's a, what's a pass of tillage is 
you know, that's at least 50 bucks an acre every time. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of uh, equipment and it, it takes, um, it takes a lot of money even to just prep the ground for a strawberry crop. It's not like planting, uh, it's not like a no-till no <laughs> no corn operation in the Midwest, that's for sure. All right, next one. So, and you guys, I don't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, it's heavy equipment, um, moving fast, because the, the other thing is you don't have a lot of time. So you're moving fast and you're getting it, you know, to get the ground ready. Um, and just the different operations. And we do use, you know, we do use like compost and whatnot. And there's just a picture of, uh, yeah, it's like sand dune ground. It's one of my farms. And we've, we've come through the big spreader and spread um, compost. That's, um, that's five tons of compost to the acre. You know, five tons sounds like a lot, but when you spread it out over an acre, it's just, it's like dust. All right, next slide. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so one of the most important things in getting ready to plant a strawberry field, the most important thing, one of the most important things is the pre-irrigation. If you don't get the pre-irrigation right, nothing works after that. So, and the pre-irrigation, now you've got this soil, it's beat to a powder because you, want the, you don't want dirt clods because dirt clods hold disease and, and, the, and the fuming it can't penetrate. So you beat the ground down to where it's just pulverized. And now you've got to fumigate it and, and work the bed. So here's this picture of the guys laying the sprinkler pipes out and you can see that's a you know, pretty, straight, pretty straight line there. I mean, it's gotta be perfectly aligned. And then on this yellow circle down over that irrigation valve, the reason I drew that circle there was those valves, they tend to leak. So when you turn the sprinkler system on until it comes up to pressure, those valves around those areas leak a lot of water. And if you'll notice that main line, you know, it's, this is portable main line. We stick it in there just for this irrigation. It's sit, we cut a ditch, it's sitting in a ditch because you, do, you don't want a wet spot. You know, so you want, you want, if there's water dripping off those valves while they're coming up to pressure and whatnot, it's a little wet spot like that creates so many problems in the future. So you, you know, you, I always put a ditch and put the main lines in that ditch and then it, it concentrates that water off to the edge where there's gonna be a road there later on. Just little techniques like that. And the other thing too, is it's just damn hard work. You know, those guys carrying those pipes out there and everything, I mean, it's, it's just hard work. All right, next one. So this is, we were talking about fumigation, that aerial picture way, way back. Uh, this was uh, the exact machine that would have been in that field if you could have seen it. And this, but this is down um, on one of my farms uh, doing flat fume. Um, after, so what they've done is they put the sprinklers out, they got the soil very, they soaked the ground. And that, and that, allows the weed seeds to start to germinate. It activates kind of the soil microbes, everything's moving and, and then it makes the fumigant a lot more effective. Um, and so we come in on damp ground and then this would be a flat fume operation, which is very expensive because you're, you're covering the whole land with fumigant with plastic, impermeable plastic and then the fumigant's being injected in and under it. Um, and sometimes we have to use flat fume because if our rotation is let's say a lettuce crop, the lettuce grower wants flat fume because he wants to know that 100% of the soil was at one point fumigated and he'll get some uh, residual benefit from that, okay? Even after a year of strawberries. Okay, next picture. Okay, uh, the next one is gonna, should be showing us, um, okay, now this is gonna, but this is a little different. Here, what we're looking at is, you can see the ground's quite wet. It looks even wetter because it was a foggy morning, but. Instead of flat fuming, what we're doing here is we've, we've irrigated the ground, but now we're putting up the beds. We haven't fumed yet. So this is the other way to do it. This is a bed fume operation, which we do a lot of. So here we've got the, the big machine, uh, big tractors with these big heavy uh, um, um, bed shapers and everything. We're putting up a bed um, and in, um, in the moist soil, you need to form the bed. Then we come in on the lower right-hand picture, you see, um, this is a machine, it's, it's putting drip tape and it's putting the bed plastic, the mulch over the bed, all in one pass. So now we've got the bed, it's covered with plastic, but not the furrow, right? And, and the drip tape is all in. And that's gonna be fumigated by 
by, by drip tape. We're gonna pump the fumigant through the irrigation tape. That's called bed fumigation. So here's a picture of that. And you can see it's set up with the tanks. And this, this was a pretty ugly looking field. This was a, I didn't have a good picture of a, it's not my field, but and one of the problems with this field, if you look real close, you can see how the plastic is kind of uneven on some of those beds, right? This is a very poorly prepared field. But anyway, it's showing the fumigation company there with their tanks of fumigant, it's been injected into the irrigation water going out into the beds. That's a less expensive way to fumigate than the flat fume because the flat fume, you got to cover the whole branch with plastic, the fumigates under the plastic, when the, then you leave it sit for two weeks, then you pick up the plastic and then you build the beds and then you still have to go put plastic on again. So you do two layers of plastic because you have to have plastic over the beds to grow strawberries. Um, for a number of reasons. Some of it's temperature control. The other is our fumigants don't control weeds anymore uh, very well. So we have to put a, in, you know, impermeable the light. So that's light blocking plastic. And a lot of the plastic, uh, it's a green color. So it's temperature neutral because you don't want to heat the bed up. You don't want to overstimulate with the uh, hot soil. So um, when you do flat fume, you, you really use a lot of plastic where, you, you know, it's like, it's, it's in the carbon footprint, I'd say politically incorrect to say it, but you know, the, the carbon footprint for strawberries with all the plastic is pretty high, I would guess. All right, let's go again, next slide. So what we do now is, so this field was either bed fumed or flat fumed, but it's all ready now to plant. So you've got the bed covered with plastic. Now the drip line's already in there, everything's ready to go. It's all GPSed out. So it's nice and square and straight, but now you have to make a hole for the, in the plastic for the plant. And what we used to do was we'd have a spike wheel on this tractor and we'd just run this spike wheel. It would turn around and we'd poke a hole in the plastic every 18 inches or however far apart we wanted the plants. And then the workers would come in with a trowel and they'd punch the hole and then they'd put the plant in there. And then what you'd have to do is you'd have to come back later and we used to have propane tanks on little like backpacks. So you'd have a whole crew. It's like, these guys are like ready to take off. Like, man, I was afraid it's, you know, some accident, right? So you got your little propane, you got your propane tank on your back with a burner. And after you plant the plants, you'd go through and you'd, 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 you'd burn the hole through over the plant because it was just a slit with a knife. And he'd have, but there's not enough for the plant to come out. So we just have to do it by hand. So some, uh, some smart young guys down in Salinas that we started working with started to build a, uh, uh, I don't want to say it's not robotic, it's an automated machine to put those holes in. And it's taken them three years, but I did 100% of the acreage with their machine this year. Um, and that's the machine. And this was basically built in a garage um, down in Salinas. These guys are just, they were just sharp young guys. They happen to be uh, from actually from Mexico. They're actually me uh, educated in Mexico and they're not, um, not with you know, the type of education that you all are getting there and they figured it out, but it's, uh, it's the coolest thing. And they got it to where it works on the hillsides too. So it'll hold a straight line on a hill. It's got side shift and tracking and everything and it puts the holes just perfect. So the workers can just come through now and put the plant in. All right, let's go look at the next one up. How are we doing? I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm going fast. If you got questions, that's fine. Um, I, I, I think get... we, well, it's 515. How's everybody holding up? Yeah. We, I, I see here, Tom, you've got maybe 15 more slides. Yeah, um, we'll go fast. 15 okay. minutes. Can you hand, is Hang that in too there, much? everybody. Get... I think we're good. Okay. All right. Okay. So Keep here's going. erosion control. Here we are putting in erosion control uh, right before we plant all on these hillsides, like I talked about. And you can see at the yellow circle, some of it's permanent. So there's a pipe under the ground there that's gonna take rainwater off the field and down a pipe all the way down that draw all the way down to a creek, but it'll keep the sand out of it. And in the smaller circle, there's a disc blade laying there on the ground. So what happens is we, when, the, when, when we're working the ground, we have to have those pipes covered up. So we cover them with a disc blade and, and then they've got like three feet of dirt on top of them, but then we can use a metal detector to go back and find them and dig them out again so we can work over them. And then, but it's tremendously hard work. And this plastic we're laying is plastic that was used plastic from our hoop houses on our raspberries. 
Okay, next one. Um, next picture is gonna be planting. Okay, we go to planting. And so here we are, all that erosion plastic is, is in, the holes are punched, everything's done, and now we're planting. So those plants you saw with that box of plants that was way back at the beginning of the slideshow sitting there, and the workers come with, and they work in teams of three, and the lady's got her little, little feed bag there that we got, and then she puts the plants in there, and then she walks ahead of the crew, or he walks ahead of the crew, and throws a plant down on the, on the top of the bed, then the other person picks it up and pushes it in the ground. So next picture is going to show that we got these little tools that we use to poke it down in there. So we're doing um, 18,000 plants an acre. So that tells you, you know, every plant has to be, how many times a human hand has to touch a plant before it gets in the ground, right? Because it had to be individually touched in the nursery and down here again, okay? All right, next picture. Okay, and, and this shows, okay, what we've got on the top, the top two slides is what it looks like immediately after it's planted. You've got dirt and dust on the top of the bed, but the little plants are sticking down in there. On the left side, you see uh, where we take the stickers off the boxes, and we'll sticker the beds with those tra tra tracking numbers. And that way, if we do get a disease problem or something that seems related to the nurseries, we've got lot numbers and we've got identification, and those will trace back to a lot up there in the Butte Valley, up by Mount Shasta from those early pictures. And then after a few weeks, and you get some rain on it and everything, and it cleans off the plastic, and the plants start to grow, and it looks like that picture below. Okay, next one, between planting and harvest, uh, this is management. So in our management, and I put the little thing there, you know, it's monitor, then it's act on what you see, and it's measure results and monitor. It's that circle all the time. So what you see here is that top left pay, uh, chart with all the little circles, so this is one of my one of the young guys I trained, and he was up from Mexico, and I trained him, and he and he's trained to count mites and ligus bugs and other insects like uh, we have to do light brown apple moth and persimilis, which is a predatory mite. So he's counting the bad mites, he's counting the good mites, he's counting ligus and light brown apple moth, and he counts the ligus. He knows how to count them by instar. Ligus have different stages in their life cycle. There was no ligus on this one; it was early in the season, but. And he's counting how many mites per leaf and he's got a deal he goes through. And I mean, his eyes are good because I can't even read it. I mean, all I see is little circles when I look at it, I can't. And, but then what he does is we total all that up, we put it into a database. And then what we get is this, you see this graph here. And this is one of the graphs I get, that I monitor. Average mites per persimilis. What this tells you is how many bad mites there are relative to good mites. And I watch that cycle. And then as you can see that first spike, right? So we counted and we saw, oh, the, the good, the, the persimilis mites aren't keeping up with the two spots. So we, we got to help it. So then we applied acromite and the Alta. And, and you can see maybe, maybe in that graph, even you could, you could imagine maybe they, uh, maybe they could have kept up. We don't know where it would have peaked, but we applied and during that, and then when we applied, it brought the population down, population continued to go down. And then we didn't have to go again um, until, um, so that was February. So we went, we went two months before he had to do another application. But that's just an example of the type of management that um, you have to do. And, and it's gotta be very precise and very systematic. Okay, all right, next one. Next picture or next slide is going to be, we'll see. Okay, this one again, a similar thing. I just wanted you to you see, and maybe some of y'all know, it could be crops people or something, you know more about this than I do. But I mean, I've got systematic, I've got to take irrigation water samples. We take plant tissue analysis. We take soil analysis. We, we look at those, we apply fertilizers. We record that, we monitor that. We monitor what we put on in our own databases because the the apps and stuff, everybody wanted all these fancy apps and everything. And I, I don't know, I can never find anything that works for me. So I build my own database on Excel or on um, Microsoft Access and, and do it that way and have my guys plug it in. And, and that's how we monitor. But again, it's that circular thing, water, soil, which is what's there. And then you look at the tissue, tells you what's in the plant. And then we try to understand those relationships. And we do that constantly. Like, that's weekly, every two weeks, you know, you're looking at that and adjusting. Okay, next one. Um, and, you, 
you know, as we do train the employees, spend a lot of time on that. And here's, here's where I took a, I had a young kid that was, he was going to junior college. It was a DACA kid, in fact. And I taught him how a little bit about irrigation. So I had him do a training, a training PowerPoint for my irrigators. And we actually translated it to Spanish. But here I was trying to train the irrigators. You know, they're out monitoring things like the tensiometers, the irrigation readings, the soil moisture readings. They're, they're recording them. But then I wanted to understand, you know, why are they doing what they're doing and what does it mean? So we do train, you know, that's an important part of this is training employees. Okay, next one. The next slide would be, this one just shows during, so between planting and harvesting the type of equipment, which you all see, right? Uh, you can see a bug vacuum there, it's folded up, the top left picture, but you see those at Cal Poly, the spray, that's one of my spray rigs down there. That's a great picture of that, this is in May, this picture, I would say, where that spray rig is, that's one of those fields that was dead by October. And look who was in May, it was perfect. It was just so sad. Anyway, um, and then on the right side, this is uh, all the spray rigs beginning of the year, they come into the shop, we, we set them all up, the Strawberry, Strawberry Commission comes uh, out, uh, straw, uh, there's students, there were students from Cal Poly here, uh, came up, you know, come up, well, of course, not with COVID, but come up, and then we calibrate the spray rigs. That's a big deal. And that's my spray crew there, and, and I make the, the guys, the drivers, the loaders, the mixers, they've all got to be there to calibrate those rigs, to under, and so they understand what they're doing, and then, then when they're out in the field, we get her done right. Okay, next one. Harvesting, this is the end. We're all still awake or, or whatever. See, if it, was Cal, if it was Cal Poly, if it was in the old days, I'd say I'd promise you guys pizza and beer afterwards, but I can't do that. So <laughs> just going to have to stay awake on your own. Um, so this is, I circled some things here. So this is a harvest. So the people are out picking the berries in the field on their little carts, and then they bring the trays in. And I'm talking about good agricultural practices, our GAP program. So if you look here on the left side, and this was kind of COVID related, but I got the arrow. Okay, distance, we maintain distance between the people. If you look at the small circle on the left, the guy has gloves on. So gloves really aren't very good for sanitation, but a lot of workers like to wear gloves um, because it protects their hands because strawberries are kind of acidic. Uh, but we have to be real careful that they change those gloves after they go in the restrooms, you know, all of that. Gloves to me are worse than bare hands in terms of a sanitation nightmare, but they do use them. And then the palette in the middle, you see a blue palette, that's your um, um, yeah, returnable palettes, uh, Chepco. So all of your big stores now, all the pallets are returnable. Well, anyway, the berries are stacked there, but you'll see that we don't ever, the tray's not touching the ground. You know, we don't want the tray to touch the ground. And then you can see the person's bringing the tray up to the person that's going to inspect the tray and, and then it's gonna scan the tray and the person for the payroll system. And they've got a piece of plastic between them. And then also up to the left, there is um, you know, garbage bag for all the trash, like the used gloves, or if they've got face masks or whatever, everything, we no garbage on the ground, everything clean. Up on the right side, just a different view of the same thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to show was the empty, the empty trays that are gonna be picked into, they're sitting on a piece of cardboard, they're not sitting on the ground. And then between the stations where it's the empty trays and where they're turning trays in, there's a distance, again, to keep people separated. That's another picture that was taken on that ranch that all died. Well, everything in that picture was dead after by October. All right, next one. And then another thing here, so these show the outhouses. You, you all have seen these. And you, in the top left-hand corner, there's a circle around some chairs stacked up there. This is, that has nothing to do with COVID, but you can't have workers sitting on the ground. So they have to take their mandatory breaks, their lunch breaks. They have to sit in those chairs, and those chairs have to be sanitized when they're done with them. And then for COVID, we had the hand wash stations. So like this one had, I think, 10 stations and we had to um, tape them off and just use three so people never got that close to each other. And one of the results of that was, was that where I used to have one unit like this for a crew, they, last year I had to have two units. So those, those units are um, $150 a month for the units, for the, to rent the units. And then my cleanings run in, um, um, well, a three unit be like $150 a week to clean it. And um, so, you know, those things are not, and then you have to have the tractor to pull it, right? There's thou tens of thousands of dollars, you know, just in the sanitation, just to keep that up to, up to speed and being done right. And we have to take those out of the field every day to be cleaned. And then they're 
they can't be cleaned in the field. You have to take them out of the field even to clean them. And there's nothing leaks out of these. They have to be all sealed up. Okay, next uh, next picture, we're almost done. Okay, we're down, we're, we've harvested the berries. We're loading them on the truck and they're gonna go to the cooler, which is post-harvest handling, which I'm not talking about. That'd be another hour and 45 minutes. You guys would be dead by then. So we're just stopping here. Uh, the berries are loaded on the truck. I don't load by hand. I, I load very few by hand. Some guys still load everything by hand. When I started farming, it was, I loaded, when I first started farming, I even personally, I mean, I loaded almost every load. First few years I farmed, we did it by hand. Um, the, I use forklift now, we load by forklift, take them into the cooler. I just wanted to think about something that people don't think about again, labeling. So here's a package of strawberries. And what I wanted you to look at here was if, on the left, there's this white label that says nature ripe fresa, and then it's all in Spanish. Okay, so, it's, so every country has labeling regulations. That's the label for Mexico. If that's going to go to Costco, Mexico, that's the kind of labeling that Mexico requires. Otherwise, it's not going to it's not going to be sold in Mexico. On the other one, if you look down on the circle on the bottom right hand side, you're going to see it's in French. Does anybody? I'll ask somebody a question. Does anybody know why our labeling? Why the labeling would be in French? Has anybody got an idea of that? Canada. Well, close. Well, Canada, but specifically, what about Canada? Well, I know they. Speak they speak French in Canada. Yeah, it's all about Quebec. Quebec. That one state in Canada. And so under Canadian law, because, of, because that one state speaks French, everything has to be bilingual French, Spanish, all, all the labels, French, English. But the, the problem is that the Mexican stuff, it's expensive to label. Those labels cost money, right? Even if they're a frac, like a half a cent a tray or whatever it is, it still costs money. You don't, you can't pre-label, right? So it, it, because then you'd have all this inventory and it would all be all mixed up. So the, some of the labeling, the French stuff, that's 100% pre-labeled, but like for Mexico, that labeling is placed by hand afterwards because you don't ever know, you don't know when you pick the berry, where that berry is going to go because it's not, it's not slotted. It's not um, dispatched until it's in the cooler at the end of the day. So it's very complex, the whole labeling thing. All right, I think, uh, Gerald, there's a couple more just to finish up. Closing slides, closing comments. I stuck this in here. This is a list of all the government regulatory agencies that I deal with, like in a week. It's nasty. Anyway, we won't go through that. You guys can look at all that, but it's just, we're it's driving this business out of the state. And if you look at what's going on in Mexico, the production season for strawberries is getting longer and longer in Mexico. They've almost closed the loop on raspberries and blackberries to where they can go 100% of the season down there. Um, they're killing this up here. Next uh, slide. And in the future for you guys. So there's a lot of opportunities for growth and innovation for those who can think and act outside the box. You know, and I think I referred to that through there. That's for you people. There's a lot of, there's a lot of potential and a lot of opportunity. And then the last slide, um, this is just, okay, this is a picture here. I, I'll make a point when we get, this is the last two slides. So this is a picture of, uh, it's actually my grandparents harvesting corn in 1939. And I keep that same picture in my office because it's like, so you don't like forget where you came from. That's harvesting corn in Iowa in 1939. The picture on the right is, you know, contemporary corn harvest in Iowa. That's the, how much it changed in that generation. Okay, look at the next slide. The left side is strawberry harvest in, up in the San Clara Valley, 1942. So about three years after my parents, my grandparents' picture. So my wife's, and this is a Japanese family. So my wife's family, they're Japanese. So her grandparents were up in this area. So this picture was taken in um, April 26, 1942, picking strawberries in Santa Clara Valley. The picture on the right is a contemporary picture of somebody picking strawberries. And so it just shows you, you know, the potential for change in strawberries that can happen, that needs to happen, right? I mean, you look at what happened in the corn industry, but you look at the strawberry industry and there's a lot of it that just, just hasn't changed. Um, you know, and so that's why there's the Strawberry Center, and that's why we focused on Cal Poly to come up with some practical solutions to, to some of our issues. And the last closing comment, this is the last slide. The only thing, the other thing about the, 
the picture before my grandparents, farming in my family skipped a generation because what happened in 19, right after 1939 was the war started, World War II, right? So my father was went into the Navy, went out to the Pacific, came back, and he did not go back to the corn farm in Indiana. He was able to get the GI Bill, became an attorney in California and practiced agricultural law. So that changed him. The, this picture here, what, you know, what happened, what happened about the, the next week after this, you see the, the, what, what happened in that, what happened to those people? Do y'all know what happened on, in May of 42, 1942? They were sent to the internment camps. Exactly. So this picture was taken just, you know, could have been days or a week or so, or weeks before these people were taken to the internment camps. So that's what actually my mother-in-law, um, she grew, you know, she went through the war in an internment camp and then later, well, part of the internment camp, and then they were taken out to Colorado uh, from the Santa Clara Valley. We were taken out to Colorado, and they uh, um, hoed uh, they um, they hoed um, sugar beets up in the San Luis Valley. They were used for farm labor. But her her sister and brothers that were in Chicago, they were not interned. They continued just normal life in Chicago. But the ones here on the West Coast, it was a rough deal. Anyway, that's good. Done talking. You can take questions. Whatever y'all want to do. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for an excellent overview of how we grow strawberries in California. I hope you all realize how detailed uh, what's involved. There's just an awful lot. And uh, there may have been a lot of uh, terminology that uh, maybe flew by you if you, if you haven't been. Uh, very familiar with strawberries or even agriculture, maybe some of the equipment, some of the practices. So, you know, please ask questions, but if uh, I understand it's it's 5.30, we won't usually go this long. Today was different, not because Tom went too long, but because I started with uh, uh, 10 minutes or so about how the class is structured and so forth. So anyways, um, any questions, go ahead and fire them off, or, or uh, if there aren't, we will, we will close. I have uh, one question. Yeah. Go ahead, Yu Chen. Um, so you talk about uh, that there's limited amount of land uh, to grow strawberry in the coast area, and a lot of them are um, suffering from soil-borne disease. Um, is that... Uh, moving to grow strawberry in another county a solution, or is uh, planting in greenhouse a solution? So, so I think you kind of, you kind of, kind of hit the nail on the head as to what the think the thinking would be. The longer term thinking in the industry is it's like it's yes and yes. You know, it's like it's all of these things. So everything's on the table. So there's the controlled environment growing, the substrate growing. Uh, there's uh, the genetics, right? There's the development of resistant varieties that can continue to grow in the soil, but still we've got the labor issue because you've got the, the demographics of, of our main labor supply, which is Mexico, um, you know, despite what's happening on the border and all that. I mean, we're, we, we, you know, we, it's not ideal to have an industry re requires the, the, the constant influx of, of young labor. Now, we we're working on the H2A immigration program. That's helping some, which is, I think is a great deal because it protects everybody and the workers and all that. But, you know, reliance on this kind of labor long-term is probably not a good thing. Um, so we have to do all of these things. And, and the variety, the genetics will also allow the crop to be grown over maybe perhaps a wider area, you know, than it is now. And with the controlled environment, you're all over across the United States because what people are looking at is if you've got controlled environment growing systems, you're not going to grow the strawberry in California. You're going to grow the strawberry in, you know, south side of Chicago and, you know, or, you know, north up the Hudson River Valley where they're looking at that kind of stuff, uh, where the population is, right? So 75% of the population, 75% of our product has to cross the Mississippi River to get sold. It's, it's, it's the population of the U.S., right? It's the way it is. Not as bad as, it's even, or it's more even than it was 30 or 40 years ago, but still, you got to get you got to get your product east of the Mississippi to sell it. So it's all of these things, which again goes to the, the opportunity for for all of you people, right? There's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Did I see another hand, Brooke? Did you were you looking to ask a question? 
yeah um i was kind of curious like how big is a commercial operation and there's with only having less than forty thousand acres in california i was i thought that was pretty awesome like awesome yeah. amazing how much you can pump out and stuff and because like i've lived on this property for 25 years and we've always grown strawberries you know so it's really neat to see a commercial side of it because um it was awesome how you said about the backpacks and the propane torches you know today they're picking running up to the trucks and stuff but I have seen them go and have those propane backpacks and they go out and poke yeah. um, the rows and things like that. And so that to me told me that the management operations over here on our property is kind of like probably like our old school and a smaller operation maybe. So I was kind of wondering what is considered a big operation. So, uh, so the number of farming operations has decreased dramatically like over the last 40 years. So when I started farming, an economic unit was um, 10, 15 acres. So, and what you generally had, especially, and it was most, so when like I started like in our marketing group, um, there was like 65 growers. Um, there was, uh, out of those 65 growers, there was two or three Hispanics and there was two or three Caucasians. The rest were Japanese. This, this, the industry was basically the Japanese Americans. At the, the one, and that, of course, that was 40 years ago. So those were the guys that came out of the war, you know, the war, war years and came back and did what they did, rebuilt their operations. But, but so you could have like three brothers and between three brothers, there'd be 50 or 60 acres or 70 acres. And that was a big farm. Uh, I went through the first years, with, even raising the family and everything, you know, I was able to do it on 50 or 60 acres. Um, economic unit now is it's up in the hundreds of acres. Um, I, I kind of struggle with what it is. I think, uh, depending on how you do it, I mean, it's, if you get into like use a labor contractor, I mean, your, your economic unit could be up in three, 400 acres or bigger 500 acres, you know, that one, one, let's say general manager could operate. And of course, then it's no longer a family farming operation, right? And then it becomes associated with the corporate marketing structure and all that. And you are like a, uh, you would be you would be like a general manager of a farming company that's got attached to a, a big marketing company because it's so high risk that you can't just be one like when I started it just me in Watsonville and my 25 acres and I had 50 acres and starting out you know if the crop failed you're done you know it's horrible right you're just and so the so it's consolidated to these larger shipping operations, integrated operations, and then they have operations all up and down the state. They've got operations in Florida, they've got operations in Mexico, and then they can average, right? They price average, they cost average uh, across a whole complete season. And that's how they stay in business. Um, Not to say that a six acre grower is, you know, maybe is associated with a big shipper and they can do their thing or, or you know, there's, there's still the niche marketers that are doing a few acres of berries and they got a fruit stand or they got a little special thing that they're doing. That's, that's a different, that's different. I think you've either got to be really small or really big. Gotcha. So there are like plantations that have like um, 200, 300 acres of strawberries. Like just oh, yep. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. hundred acre blocks. I mean, you know, that one ranch I showed you has a hundred acre block. I mean, I, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot, I would say, I don't know what percentage of the industry, but, you know, a lot of it's planted at least in 50 acre blocks, if not 100 acre blocks and some bigger. I think the biggest one I've seen is um, there's one in Florida. It's a, it's a section. It's one section. So that's 640 acres contiguous one planting of strawberries. <laughs> that, that's the upper extreme. But, but um, um, you know, there's California. Yeah, you can see uh, you can you can find blocks of berries that are contiguous 150 or 200 acres mm -hmm. wow and it's all hand picked still yep wow. yep Amazing. yeah unless gerald unless you got something up your sleeve or john lynn or somebody down there i haven't heard recently well you're gonna these students are gonna hear all about it at our next lecture right yeah. the advanced farm is one of the leaders in this technology and they're just starting to to do this uh, not not any kind of a large scale it's just a, they're just trying it out they are harvesting berries they are, they are marketing those berries that are harvested with the robots but 
it's by no means uh, everywhere. Just like the, the, the piece of equipment that Tom showed where they were punching the holes in the plastic, that isn't to say that everybody's doing that. Very, almost nobody's doing that, right? Tom, maybe just your operation and a couple others maybe. Most people are yeah. still doing the backpack yeah. uh, burn method. I think that thing will catch on, you know, it's first year where they really did the large commercial acreage, you know, they, they probably did, they might have done a couple thousand acres up here this year, actually. I don't know, just for us, I know it was in the high, you know, I, I know they did three or 400, you know, in, my, in our operation. So uh, between a couple of the guys. So, yeah, so it's, it's very dynamic. Things are, things are getting, you know, pop, more popular. It's just like the varieties. It starts off with a few acres. If it, if it works well, it expands to more acres. And then pretty soon it's a, industry-wide practice yeah like we're we use a drone um a little bit to uh, distribute um persimilis mites the predatory mites we used to do that by hand um i use a drone when i can now because they got a little thing now they put the drone and it can drop the mites out the bottom flying around the field because again it's just less labor less exposure to workman's comp claims you know that somebody falls down and sprains an ankle i mean every time somebody walks through a field there's a risk, you know, and even nowadays, you know, it used to be you'd get a, you'd get a, a rainy day and, and it might stop raining in the morning and you'd go pick in the afternoon. Not, not anymore. I don't do it anymore because if that, if I see that there's any kind of like slickness on the road, if that, if those field roads are, are muddy, it, it's just too much risk. I mean, somebody gets hurt and then you've got the whole regulatory, all that, however many I showed you there. 50 different regulatory agencies descend on you and you're going to be in court and everything else. It's miserable. I've spent more time in depositions and court time and regulatory hassles. You know, it's just gotten worse. That part of it is not fun at all. Hmm. Or either that you get old, but you don't have any patience left or something. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Very good. Any other questions? All right. I think we'll bring this to a close. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Uh, re remember everybody to fill out your uh, your uh, feedback form and send it in. May as well do it now while you're you're sitting here and uh, get it over with. And yep. uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next uh, seminar. All right. And kind of, I was serious. You know, if you want to come up and see the farm, don't be afraid to you know, ask Gerald, and we'll, we'll yeah. work it out soon. Okay. All right. Take advantage of that offer. There you go. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.